like other isms, this is ideologically neutral. So there should be no problem. This is just the organization principle. I have, uh, by the way, I was impressed and I was sharing with Pajasar that first time I have seen my own picture on the banner, which <laughs> sounds that um, it is kindness of you, but uh, otherwise the ideas matter more. Uh, and uh, we all uh, are students and uh, we will mutually learn from each other. Uh, about the Eighteenth Amendment, if we have to understand, I will just uh, try to recall and refresh, refresh certain uh, terms which will frequently figure in our discussion. <coughs> the first one is about decentralization and revolution. If you have a background in political science, these are terms used to convey almost similar meaning. But in qualitative terms, they are two different terms. Both decentralization and revolution mean sending authority, competences, jurisdictions downward. But if you try to dissect them in the realm of governance, decentralization is by and large in the sense of assigning certain responsibilities. And it can happen even in unitary form of states, the way United Kingdom is the example, and it was only in early 90s or mid 90s that Scottish, British and Irish assembly started getting some kind of decentralized parts. Um, and this term is very important in Pakistani context as well whenever we invoke this and use this as a surrogate for revolution. Whereas devolution in legal and constitutional context is like allocating something. Allocating where? In the constitution, the social contract of that particular nation. A signed pass could be taken back through executive order. The process of taking back or assigning more is pretty convenient in decentralization. Whereas when we talk about devolution and if, if it is embedded in the constitution, normally and more specifically in the federally organized states, amendment in constitution is slightly difficult process. It requires two-third majorities in both houses the People's Chamber and the Chamber of States or Provinces, the Senate in our case. So whenever we use these terms, ostensible meaning and net result is transferring power, jurisdiction, competences, responsibilities towards the lower order of governance. So but in qualitative terms, <coughs> both in my understanding, are different concepts. Uh, just to explain uh, why this is done, there is a Swiss principle of subsidiarity that while the liberal no please on the back, while the liberal concept of uh, about state is it is a necessary evil we need it if we have to graduate from a tribal society to a society that is organized on modern lines, but how the various functions will be parked at various tiers. Uh, this principle of subsidiarity explains that uh, the nearest tier, which is uh, that can serve the citizens best and in a vibrant manner. Uh, that's why uh, one can drive logic for a vibrant local government uh, that. Uh, Citizens being consumer of democracy and governance uh, have much more transactional relationship with the local governance uh, and less with the provincial and even further less uh, with the federal one. 
Then in terms of uh, making sense of devolution, I will try to uh, put before you both the vertical uh, devolution that uh, could be brought into discussion and the horizontal uh, uh, devolution. The horizontal one is very simplistic. It is it emanates from the core concept of trichotomy of power or trias politica, that separation of powers between various branches of the government. Uh, in Pakistani case, I will come back to that. But the vertical one is more important. The federal level, what will be the uh, functions competences at the provincial level and then at the local level. I will just combine, I have heard from many politicians who were crafting the Ajin Amendment that the federal level unfortunately is just a tier of governance week where you consume most of your energies appeasing the defense and tech establishment. And you have a very little space to exhibit your government's talent. It might be about Kashmir policy, it might be about Afghan policy, it might be about negotiations with International Monetary Fund and other international donors. Uh, and by and large, if you dissect deeper, you will come to know most of the federal spaces are monopolized by either the defense, international and local, or debt establishment. In that kind of situation, the political talent could be exhibited only at the provincial level. That's why this core concept of provincial autonomy dominates and political parties with provincial character articulation of demands emerge. And uh, in my own understanding, yes, the narrative, popular narrative is of South Asian Muslims movement in Pakistan, but the way Pakistan was created, uh, unless we make sense of that, we won't be able to appreciate the diversity and the cry for provincial autonomy in Pakistan. Being a student of Pakistan studies, uh, I can tell you that there were three mechanisms or methods through which the constituent units of today's Pakistan joined Pakistan. The first one was vote within the legislatures. It happened in Punjab where there was a tie and the Christian speaker of Pajab Sambhi at that time, Mr. S. P. Singha, he casted the casting vote. And there were three questions offered to him. Independence, being part of India, being part of Pakistan. So that kind of legislative vote took place in Bengal, in Punjab, in the municipality of Quetta regarding the future of British Balochistan. Then there were referendums where people were asked to go for answering certain questions in referendum, and that happened in NWFP, today's Kavakakulha, and Sivaraj province. Third way, the way these uh, states or various areas joined Pakistan was the voluntary or coercive annexation of princely administered states. And if you measure the uh, area and resources they brought, they outnumber many, many other realities. And I can qualify that. This union state of Kalat, Lasdila, Makran, and all. You, uh, the state of Bahawalpur, and if you have, and that is the classical example what we have done uh, by ignoring the compositional diversity of Pakistan, 
Bahadurpur was a state if you have visited Lahore's Pan-Continental Hotel. There is a car parked there, which was gifted by the Nawab of Bahadurpur to the Governor General of newly established state. There is a Bahadurpur house in Lahore, which serves as the residential area for the government servants. The new state had no secretariat and space to uh, offer shelter to their employees. And they even put the bill of initial salaries. Such a rich state joining Pakistan after 68 years, there is a hue and cry, please let us live. What happened? That if we are able to decipher in this story of denying federal uh, rights to various constituent units, then there are states of the Chitran, Am, Zawar, and many more which join Pakistan at certain phases of history. Provinces had their existence and democratic contribution towards creation of Pakistan. The first thing which the newly born state did in 1954-55 was denied them their identity by merging them into one unit. Quite interestingly, all the provinces which had their historical names, all of a sudden they lost even their names. They were East Pakistan and West Pakistan. Uh, maybe if we even dissect deeper, there was the first centralism called from the 31 respected ulemas who met in Multan and came with their 22 points. Ethno-neutral provinces admit Organization of states along administrative lines figures as a demand for first time in that particular document. So, this, I hope this makes a little sense why provinces are very uh, particular about their identity. They speak for their rights. Then comes the local affairs. If in Islamabad you have a military government, you get and you are interested in political proxies. Non-party based local government elections so that they can become ladder of legitimacy for you. And it happened uh, during Ayub era. They became the electoral college in the name of basic democracies. It happened during uh, Zia time. Uh, they volunteered to uh, organize referendum and even subsequently uh, official Muslim League. It happened during Musharraf time when uh, they again uh, organized referenda and uh, um, finally emerged, emerged, emerged into PML Khadiyasam. So, military regime was apolitical but practically political proxies. Whereas the political elite which developed played a significant role at federal level because of the defense and debt establishment, they want to use administration as a proxy to perpetuate their federal client relationship. That's why that brings in the posting pathology, Merapna Thamedar Hona Chahiye, Merapna DC Hona Chahiye, Merapna SP Hona Chahiye. So they try to operate through that. Uh, because if they opt for political uh, proxies, then they have to share the political space. They, they want to uh, live with the executive domain. Therefore, in my understanding, I find this term grip in Pakistan. The way we organized the state, it was a centralized grip. Government, revenues, ideology, institutions, policies, us, whatsoever. It was a federalized grip. Whereas the compositional diversity and the foundational dream was different. 
Then we look at the horizontal devolution. Ostensibly we opted for Christ's politica, the trichotomy of art. But practically what happens, each tear intrudes into the other tear. Executive, how they intrude into the legislature, their power to propagate ordinances, presidential and governance ordinances. In a way that is usurpation of the legislative part of the legislature. How legislature, of course, legally they have a right to offer a small component of the executive in the form of ministers and all, but that is again specified. Only 11% of the total membership of the legislature could be minister and this amendment was brought by the 18th amendment. How they intrude into executive by being on the boards of various institutions. That parliament agents will go and sit on the boards of various institutions. Then comes the judiciary. How they intrude uh, in executive or legislative domains. Um, one very recent example, um, a case or about the status of minorities, the citizens of other faith in Pakistani society, where judiciary specifically commanded the executive to do A, B, C, C. Uh, Workers' Party case in terms of electoral reforms, where judiciary commanded to the executive or maybe an autonomous uh, constitutional body to do A, B, C, D. So in that way, the boundaries or the clear mandates, boundaries are blurred and there is, there are so many other mechanisms. For example, I'm, I was trying to collect the information to be precise, how military intervenes in this trichotomy of power. Always the defense secretary is appointed on behest of the armed forces, either a retired general or somebody who is their nominee. Otherwise, from the normal executive, they are not even willing to digest defense secretary. Same goes for the law secretary. Many serving judges of High Court and Supreme Court, on various occasions, like I can give you the names, but they have been serving as the law secretaries. So, in a way, this uh, horizontal revolution is blurred by using these uh, so many things. So, result is distorted institutional spaces. And now, if we import an other concept into this, we have a civil service organized on the pattern of Indian civil service. Very little efforts to indigenize it or reform it. We have a same Anglo-Saxon uh, judiciary, same colonial pattern of military, even the regiments, those which were formed during the colonial era, they enjoy the same titles. And then you have one odd reality out, indigenous emerging political class. The elite character of army, judiciary, bureaucracy, then comes, <coughs> ostensibly, if you believe in the concept of lean government, that is a management uh, term, uh, ideally it should be both in terms of size, scale, scope, spending power, uh, revenue powers, ideally it should be a federal democratic pyramid. The federal government should do what is necessary and must be done by the government. Uh, they say defense, currency, communication. That's why it, both in terms of its size, scale and scope, it has to be small. More the framework, maybe framework constitutional belongs to the federal, but framework in terms of policy, public policy, has to come from province maybe you can incorporate indigenous variant and then 
the transactional relationship happens at the local level. So ideally, local should be more in terms of size, scale and scope, province little less and federal little less. What we have, in fact, is inverted pyramid. And this term I borrow from Dr. Huck's work. Uh, once he wrote about inverted pyramid and uh, Dr. Well, it, it was perhaps in the economic term, but it could be uh, applied in political terms as well. We have overgrown federal government and when this devolution was happening, we came to know other than formally recruited federal government employees, we have many project employees, we have many program employees and uh, to my utter surprise, the most two vital social sector employees, the lady health visitors, they were program employees. And finally, the Supreme Court had to decide about their fate that they should be regularized. Even in the sec health sector, the education sector, the employees of National um, Commission on Human Development or something like that. But unfortunately, we have squeezed local, little bit provincial, but overgrown uh, federal. And I import the metaphor of balanced body. polio, you are not able to walk. So governance has to be like the metaphor of a balanced body, where what role has to be performed, uh, that should be clearly delineated. Next please. Now, if we look at, uh, I won't go into the details because you must be familiar with the oscillating political history of Pakistan. We have been subject to four military uh, regimes, but the term reclamation I will use there, the resilience of citizens of Pakistan reclaimed their democracy four times. Since 1947, if we analyze the politics of Pakistan, there is a one common chord, and that is a demand for provincial autonomy, provincial rights. And we are the first post-colonial state which in fact experienced dismemberment. We lost our territory. We lost our people and the grievance was around fair distribution of resources, equitable participation in the political processes that we tried to circumvent through principles of parity and so many odd examples of one unit and all. And quite interestingly, juxtaposed reality is that whenever we were subjected to military regime, the political resistance was organized on the principle of provincial autonomy. And that particular idiom figures quite prominently. I collected all these documents, whether they were the 21 point of Juktu Front. Can today a university student imagine? that if he or she is discontented with the political culture of this society, they can test election against the sitting chief minister or a prime minister and defeat them. The strength of the 21 point of Juktu front was that a student of Dhaka University, Abdul Khalik, defeated the sitting chief minister, Nurul Amin, at that time. That was the power of the message around provincial autonomy. Second time, if you see, by the way, six points were first announced in Lahore. Again, they are written in the idiom of provincial autonomy. They were upgraded later on. Then if you look at the MRD declaration, Movement for Restoration of Democracy, they specifically came with a charter of provincial autonomy and then finally the charter of democracy. 
which was inked by two major political parties uh, during Musharraf time. Again, it is written in the idiom of provincial autonomy. Now, why constitution is important? I usually raise this question, how many of you have seen the constitution of Pakistan? How many of you have read it? If we are the only 2-3% lucky, those who have crossed the educational jungle of Pakistan and have reached the <coughs> higher education level, this is the user manual of statecraft. Primarily, constitutions are written in two ways. Either they are the political covenant, the way the Constitution of the United States, they explain the directions and dimension and nature of the state, Broader boundaries are drawn, but our constitution is pretty proceduralist. It is a product by two legal brains, Abdullah Pisti Zada and Sulfekar Ali Bhutto. And later when it was amended, again it was amended by the legal brain, Raza Rabani. So proceduralist <coughs> constitution becomes a user manual of statecraft. It should be on every functioning table of the executive, judiciary, and legislature. Because wherever, if product, you find some problem in the product, you refer back to the user manual. If you won't, your product will crash. This happened to Pakistan. It is, and if I share with you, I ask this question to those people who are supposed to operationalize the constitution, the executive branch. How many of you have read it? Very few. How many of you have in your office? Very few. And I asked a very stupid question, that whenever parliament passes a law which relates to your particular department, how do you internalize it? Is there a collective study circle, reading, what? Shocking answer was, whenever there is any litigation, we give it to some legal wizard to come up with a summary so that if that summary clicks, it then widely circulates and makes sense within the executive. Otherwise, it is like my childhood story, blind man and elephant, who can make how much sense of the elephant by touching it or entering into some kind of experiential relationship. That's why more problems belong to the executive branch. Whereas parliament has a luxury. If a bill is introduced, it is immediately referred to a standing committee, which is specific to that subject. So they can brainstorm. They come up with the report, which is later presented in the parliament, and still two readings are left and you get the opportunity to influence, amend the constitution, uh, the, uh, the, that piece of legislation. Uh, when it is passed, it has to be operationalized through the rules which have to be crafted by the executive. What happens? Usually the draftsmen in law ministry or cabinet ministry, they come up with standardized operational and most of the laws don't, even don't have their rules. Uh, we were advocating on right to information law and it took years to convince the executive that please uh, come up with the rules. So now we have uh, a user manual which has been circumvented many times and the most odd reality is that now it is being circumvented <laughs> only to appease international debt and defense community as well. Uh, otherwise, dictators circumvented it. We opt for convenient. During military regime, every law starts notwithstanding anything written in the constitution or in existing law. This is the hukm shahi This is the order of the day. And can you imagine, the parliament of Pakistan had the opportunity to amend the constitution 20 times and out of that two times you have to discount because 9th amendment and 15th amendment were never passed. So 
So practically 18 times they have amended it. Can you imagine how many time journals they are amended it through with PCOs, RCOs and all? 31 times. Musharraf, I was able to count 16 times. And when I'm saying times, that means 17th Amendment, so-called LFO, affected many articles, but these were the occasions where they had a chance to issue PCO, LFO, RCO, and trust me, none of them was pro-citizen. Whereas whenever constitutional development has happened in political domain, we started with 11 fundamental rights enshrined in 1956 constitution, 62 constitution bestowed by a military dictator, there was zero concept of fundamental rights, rather the constitution made them principles of law making and Sheikh Mujib and many other who were the opposition leaders, they said, well we dispute your legitimacy, but this is going to be the only constitution in the world which denies its citizens basic fundamental rights. Uh, 73 constitution brought about 21-24 and 18th amendment expanded the scope to further for right to education, right to information, due process and no discrimination on the basis of gender, faith and all. <coughs> now whatsoever I have uh, tried to present before you, if we just graphically try to understand what has happened. And this was my one recent calculation, though I used to fail in maths when I was student, but to make sense of um, some political argument, I calculate the days. Uh, the constitutional life of Pakistan is very limited. The Dominion status, I excluded it, and then constitution of 1956, just for 928 days. Constitution of 62, I uh, shared what were the problems in that. For 2,482 days. The Constitution of 1973, ostensibly the figure is very impressive. It has been here for 14,992 days. But unfortunately, it includes the period of uh, abeyance, abrogation, whatsoever was there. If we count the entire PCOs and LFOs, that is about uh, 2,944 days. And quite interestingly, if I share with you the real life of 1973 constitution during Zulfiqar and Ikutur's days, 73 to 5th July 77, only 1420 days. And after 18th Amendment, it is going to be the fourth year to get multiplied. Then there is a popular opinion of Pakistan, and this is what General Ayub used to uh, plead. Um, you can't wear um, a tweed coat in a, a hot CP or whatsoever, you have to tailor the constitution according to the mizaj of people here. Pakistan practically, dominion status, again it was dominated by Governor General. Ayub Khan, Yahya Khan, Zia, Bhutto Saab for a brief time and uh, Ghulam Saab Khan Saab for a brief time. Presidential rule, and these are figures by the way, up to 31st August, because it was published in uh, Herald of September, so uh, that was the deadline, so I counted, so you have to add more days wherever they belong. Uh, presidential form, pure, we had for 9,203 days, whereas pure parliamentary form we had only for 8,520 days, so it nullifies in terms of the uh, experiential example that we have been in the hybrid where president in uniform was there beneath him Jamali, Junejo and all uh, it is about 3623 years. In total we have been more under presidential form of government 
So uh, those who market it that if we go for presidential system, maybe our uh, that is the way to salvation. Practically, we have suffered because of that. And remember the compositional diversity of Pakistan. And then who ruled? Again, the military rule and all. Uh, these are the statistics uh, available on our web as well. And uh, if you are interested, you can browse that. Next, please. In this context, I developed. Next. I try to develop two things. If I have to develop a red card for Pakistan, what, what is problematic for Pakistan? That is uh, conflict among ethnicities, on provincial rights, different. But since 1979, we have a Cold War, Cold War, and since 2001, this war is pretty overt and you see consequences all around in terms of extremism, um, terrorism, and then the inherent disequilibrium between civil and military relations, and politics is weak. Um, both these statistics will convey. But then, at the same time, there is an option of green card. When two major political parties those who used to compete and fight each other, they decided to agree on something. They inked Charter of Democracy in May 2006. And unlike the 26, uh, 21 point of uh, Jukta Fran, six points of Mujib, uh, MRD declaration, the Charter was the only lucky document that sustained the political consensus when both parties came into power. Resultantly, uh, many things happened. Seventh NFC, although we are living in the seventh NFC, but there are only three awards which were politically negotiated. The first one during Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto time, the second uh, one was the fourth award which was negotiated during uh, Nawaz Sharif Saab's time, and the third one was the seventh award. Rest were the executive orders. The military regimes are not able to finalize the National Finance Commission award, which is about the distribution of resources among the Federation and the Federating units. Then a new uh, mechanism of Aghazi-Hakuke Balochistan, but more importantly, uh, Parliamentary Committee on National Security, Parliamentary Committee on Constitutional Reforms, and the 18th Amendment is the product. I won't go into the details of the nitty gritty of the 18th Amendment. I have tried to theorize it that this amendment has done three things to Pakistan. Please, next one. <coughs> First, its background. It is indigenous and home ground. NRB was funded by international community. Village Aid was funded by international community. Here is a set of reform which was politically negotiated, indigenous and home reform. That's why you find some resistance within the donor community. And if you will be interested, I will share in detail with you. It first time addresses almost all core questions. In terms of administrative, legislative and physical reforms. It has in a way written the federal provincial pact and expanded the scope of fundamental rights. But if I theorize, I, I consider it has introduced three things. First is the paradigm of institutional power. This country has suffered because of individual dictatorial powers. How it has introduced the paradigm of institutional powers? It has made Parliament repository of so many things. Council of Common Interest has to be answerable. National Economic Council has to be answerable. National Finance Commission has to present biannual report what is happening. What are the resources and revenues generated and how much has been given to the provinces. Parliament has a role 
in appointment of judges. Parliament has a role as an institution in appointment of caretaker government, chief election commissioner, whether ceremonial or whatsoever. And if there has to be a referenda, unlike Zia and Musharraf referendum, 18th Amendment makes it mandatory that the joint sitting of the parliament has to design and draft the question. In a way, I call them institutional, civilized safeguards to protect democracy. That if you discount parliament from the trias politica equation, you won't have judges, you won't have caretaker governments, you won't have the uh, uh, election commission, and many more. So this is a unique safeguard and then instead of empowering the Prime Minister, the notion is of institutional powers. That both leader of the house, leader of the opposition, equal member from the opposition, equal member from the treasury, to sit in committees, decide, negotiate and decide. Second paradigm which one can uh, draw out of the 18th Amendment, it envisages proactive provinces. That now province has to design and craft under Article 148 a vibrant indigenous according to their specific socio-economic development local government system. But constitution was generous to offer at least the four benchmarks that you can't go below that, beyond that, is your own imagination. Same goes for proactive provinces in terms of natural resources, joint and equal ownership of oil and gas. Then uh, it also offers a constitutional safeguard <coughs> that in terms of percentage share between the federation and uh, provinces, NFC can't go less in favor of provinces because it happened when we imported a, um, a finance minister from IMF and uh, he simply reversed uh, the federal spending passed up to 80 percent and provincial was reduced to 20 percent whereas traditionally it used to be the vice versa so that's why this constitutional safeguard came and perhaps that's why the government is reluctant to embark or initiate eighth NFC negotiation. And the third one uh, is a unique concept and this concept resonated when uh, even the 1973 constitution was being adopted or the 18th amendment was being passed. And that was that Pakistan has suffered because we lack cooperative federalism in Pakistan. It becomes always war of turf and territory. ये तो हमारी आपकी सोसाइटी में बदाम बढ़ जाता है, हादसा हो जाता है। हम तय कर रहे होते हैं कि मेरे खाने की हद में है या नहीं। So we, in fact, try to explore cooperative federalism, but military regime, because of their centralized nature, we deviated from that. That's why now it has become a binary: either a federal government or the provinces or the local or has to be my, minus out of this equation. It is not a divorce from the federal to the province or to the local. Rather, we have to import the metaphor of a joint family where everybody sits, decides, and figures out the best possible way. And why I say that, in federal legislative list two, a specific new entry was inserted and that is the entry 13, interprovincial matters and coordination. What does it mean in simple terms? Metaphor of a joint family, not a divorce. But Islamabad can't usurp <coughs> by using or employing power. Provinces can voluntarily assign asymmetrical responsibilities to the federation and vice versa, even federation can assign asymmetrical responsibility to a province or the provinces. 
and it is very much written in uh, from the chapter which deals with federal provincial relations article 141 up to 147 uh, up to 170 something uh, i will be more specific up to 174 read this chapter it will explain provinces voluntarily 18th amendment just added one so that there is no question that it is subject to a parliamentary resolution in the provincial assembly this is how we created drug regulatory authority by the way polio chaos which we experience every day it is still a federally executed subject <laughs> provinces can't be blamed that oh 18th amendment aayi to har cheez barbaad ho gayi barbaad islamabad mein bhi ho sakta hai aur uski wajuhat kuch aur hai so uh, the third one was this metaphor of joint family पहले हमारा माई बाप प्रयास ये सूबों का भी मसला है वो भी समझते हैं अब्बा जी कमाएंगे हम खाएंगे वो आईएमएफ से लाएंगे या वर्ल्ड बैंक से जहां से भी तो वो इट हैज टू बी अ मेटाफर ऑफ ए ज्वाइंट फैमिली वेर एवरी बॉडी कॉन्ट्रीब्यूट इन जनरेटिंग रिसोर्सेज एट द रिस्पेक्टेड टेयर एवरी बॉडी हैज टू बी रिस्पॉन्सिबल एट रिस्पेक्टेड टेयर इन टर्म्स ऑफ सर्विंग दीपल नेक्स्ट प्लीज वी अबॉलिश दंट्रेंट प्लेस and this was not if one says it was a consensus decision but it was a contested decision there are if you have to make sense of uh, 18th amendment one are the 102 amendments introduced to the constitution other is a set of recommendations given to the executive where the parliament thought it to be prudent that this could be done through executive measure and the third one is a set of notes of reiterations and i describe it pending politics where people contested that oh no you are going to devolve curriculum but it might have some problem and this is a load of reiteration by asan ikbal on behalf of pmlm there is a similar note of reiteration from pmlq but the popular overwhelming consensus was among all major parties that no that curriculum has to go to provinces so if you circumvent on behalf of the international donor community and create uh, take back what constitution has given to the provinces by creating national curriculum council and all it will be chaotic it will be in a new um, encroachment on the provincial powers if you want to have the, in india is example education was a state subject states decided that no it should be on concrete list our constitution provides a way you pass a resolution and through this provincial assembly and curriculum can come back by the way if we go deeper uh, it, uh, i find many positive outcomes coming out of the curriculum and if you want to uh, listen in balochistan after 18th amendment for first time we have established department of marine biology we have established department of coastal management which was ne which never existed in the imagination of islamabad so devolution has its positive impact had devolution been uh, done earlier maybe khaybar pakhtunkhwa had a very effective department of refugee management we hosted largest number of refugees in the world but that subject was not in the imagination of islamabad had we introduced that entire unhcr and international organization of migration would have been stuck with pakistani expertise and brains we would have contributed to that knowledge so that we can discuss in detail so 18th amendment abolished the concurrent list no new ministry was created with the exception of one that was cad capital administration and development because this capital has to uh, consume the similar set of services education health and all otherwise every ministry which went to the provinces had its line department already operational and remember my concept of grid islamabad will back plan and provinces were just the execution arms so now what 18 amendment has done but you are already execution arms 
now you plan for yourself and if you lack resources, six new taxes were given to the provinces. They are very much vigilant only in collecting one, which is the general sales tax on services. But even if your new taxation regime is not sufficient to put the bill of the social services, provinces were given pass to raise loan within the prescribed limits by the National Economic Council. Unfortunately, Islamabad has yet to do that. Then, ideally, provinces should have gone for similar multi-factor formula instead of block allocation which they do now to their districts or some of the provinces adhere to the provincial finance commissions. Uh, I hope I'm not overstretching the time or still I have some, some moments. Please do tell me when uh, I have to come back to the question <coughs> answer. So, uh, we should have opted for the provincial finance commissions. Unfortunately, we failed to do that. We still resort to uh, block allocations. And by the way, this is the most well-documented process. Uh, and I hope your uh, institute have copy of the 18th Amendment re report, notes of reiterations, Implementation Commission report, and if not, I will be happy to uh, send a copy so that this is the most well-documented process in the history of Pakistan. Only uh, I can't read on somebody's behalf. Everybody has to read it if they want to make sense of it. I have already mentioned Article 141 to 174 deals with provincial autonomy. Federation Provinces relation, out of 34 articles, 17 were amended, more than half, almost half. So that means, uh, qualitatively, federal-provincial relationship has been redesigned. Within that, we have to have a very prudent federation, uh, we need to have very proactive provinces. And many people confuse all oh, uh, marriage law, this law, that law. By the way, we, have, we live with colonial laws as of today. But 18th Amendment addressed it. It created by hiding it somewhere in the Constitution. A new concurrency, which is Article 142, which explains. And that is about criminal law, uh, criminal justice and uh, law evidence. I mentioned Entry 13, Council of Common Interest, National Finance Commission, National Economic Council. Next please. <coughs> now I will just provide you certain glimpse how this is working. After dismemberment of Pakistan in 1971-1973 constitution is a post-conflict constitution which tried to address the contentious issues of provincial autonomy. It tried to give things which belong to the provinces. And I was reading the debate, and if we go stricto senso uh, by the intention of legislature, to be honest, Council of Common Interest should have control over railway, VAFTA, and all institutions. And the original scheme never envisaged even ministries for these departments. And that debate, when, when clause-wise constitution was being adopted, if you read that, provinces, if they are proactive, they can claim much more from Islamabad. But to address this contentious issue, what Hafiz P. Ziyada, the law minister at that time, and author of the constitution, marketed that we have found a solution, and solution is an institutional mechanism. And the institutional mechanism is Council of Common Interest. That whatsoever are the subjects primarily belonging to the provinces, we will sit together and nobody... Prime Minister became chairman after 18th Amendment. The original scheme never envisaged that Prime Minister will be there. It will be four from the provinces, four from the federation. You have to convince at least one. If you have to get it decided in favor of the federation, you need to have one province on board. Or if you want to get it decided in the favor of the provinces, you need to have one from the federation on board. Only then majority decision will happen. 
But how we use this institution? Zulfikar Ali Bhutto time, only three meetings perhaps. Then we had uh, very few meetings. Uh, Zia zero, Benazir zero. You might be surprised why zero. Uh, in 1990, first time we formed the rules of Council of Common Interest. And those rules said that at least the presence of three chief ministers is essential if that uh, meeting has to be legalized. She was not lucky to have three chief ministers at any given time on her side. Whereas Nawaz Sharif Saab was lucky, so he chaired three meetings during his first tenure. Uh, one was done by Moin Qureshi Saab, where we changed so many things. Uh, by the Supreme Court and the political class, this allowed the recent caretaker government that, sorry, you can't have a meeting of Council of Common Interest. They invited, but that was later on converted into federal consultation. Because this is an institution, if it has teeth, it lives up according to its spirit. This is the most important institution for federalism in Pakistan. Nawaz Sharif second time, three. Musharraf zero. Shaukat Aziz, Steel Mill Beja. Supreme Court Neka. Sorry, these assets belong to the nation. Provinces have equal rights. You go to the Council of Common Interest and get a decision there whether you can privatize or not. Same is being questioned now. Then all of a sudden, Eight meetings during Yusuf Raza Gilani. Why? Because constitution now commands that every quarter there has to be one meeting. But unfortunately, uh, provinces, now the last was on 29th May, more than 150 days have passed. Uh, right there is no meeting, but provinces are equally lethargic. I say reluctant Islamabad and lethargic provinces. They are the problem of Pakistan's federalism. Uh, Islamabad is reluctant to uh, give away the power, and provinces are lethargic to internalize what they are entitled to. They can requisition. This is a new clause added uh, in this regard. And there is a binary benefit as well, by the way, I enjoyed the polio meeting where uh, Pervez Khattak, um, Chief Minister from a swing province, uh, was not at a speaking terms with the Prime Minister, but he had to come. Next slide, the Khayana. Whenever there is a meeting of Council of Common Interest, they informally sit, they chit chat, they discuss, and communication vectors are very weak in our society. So these opportunities provide ample space so that they can <coughs> come up with uh, answers. I won't go into the details. Constitution, next one. Constitution commands that various reports should be presented in the parliament, both of CCI, NEC, NFC, principles of policy. They have been, next one, they have been presented, but uh, Unfortunately, zero debate has happened. Uh, we need proactive parliament. Next, please. Education, as I mentioned, uh, in 1935 Act, it was a provincial subject. As of today, uh, it has been devolved, it was been tested, but unfortunately, we have again created Education Ministry, whose name has been changed four times. And provinces have been objecting. We have circumvented the constitution on do donors' behalf to create National Curriculum Council. Sindh has protested. Uh, by the way, we need to rethink governance in, from another context as well. I was reading the Economic Survey, which is the official document, 2013-2014, and I was shocked that in rural area, only 74% attend public schools, 26% attend private schools, madrasas. You will be surprised in urban Pakistan, only 41% attend public schools and 59% attend private schools. And these so-called education ministries and curriculum councils and all, they have zero impact and control. So better you think about how service delivery has to be re-engineered 
इंस्टेड ऑफ गोइंग फॉर सेम टर्फ एंड टेरिटरी वॉर ये जी मेरा थाना है इसमें आप कुछ नहीं कर सकते ये मैं करूंगा एंड लुक एट दी टेक्स्ट बुक्स विच सेम हैज प्रोड्यूस्ड एंड द काइंड ऑफ लेसन दे हैव बिन कॉर्पोरेटेड आई हैव गॉट सेट ऑफ दैट बट वी नीड टू रीड दैट नो बॉडी हैज डिविएटेड फ्रॉम द ऑफिशियल नेरेटिव राधर दे हैव pluralized the narrative and they have incorporated their provincial perspective same goes for the universities out of uh, on agc website 156 uh, degree awarding institution about 69 or 44% are in the private sector next please they have passed uh, laws but just mere passage of law is not important uh, we have compulsory primary education law since 1962 but nobody adhered to uh, lot is happening in uh, curriculum is becoming a new turf for war in khyber pakhtunkhwa they have um, uh, reversed what changes amp brought maybe then use the inter provincial coordination clause where you evolve the benchmark who will be the hero in your textbook next please this kind of picture i saw for first time after 18th amendment even security is not the internal security is not the sole jurisdiction of the federal government you have to sit decide and now punjab has passed a law as well that kind of picture where army chief the uh, chief ministers the interior minister prime minister are standing together it was unique in the history of pakistan revenues pers is more important than policy सिंध क्रिएटेड रेवेन्यू बोर्ड पंजाब क्रिएटेड खैबर पख्तून खान क्रिएटेड एन एफ सी आई से दे हैव गॉट मेनी मोर रिसोर्सेज एंड दी रिपोर्ट विच आर प्रेजेंटेड इन द पार्लियामेंट रिवील दैट प्रोविंस आर कलेक्टिंग मोर नेक्स्ट प्लीज नाउ वट शुड बी डन एंड दिस इज टूवर्ड्स द क्लोरियर ऑफ दिस टॉक ट्रस्ट प्रोविंसेज प्रोविंसेज क्रिएटेड पाकिस्तान just quantifying that you are more patriot and they are less patriot they will run away they will do this they will do that is not the answer transfer has already happened transition is the phase and let's together transform it for that we need hand holding if you are not happy constitutions are not carved on stone must a two third majority change the constitution we need to facilitate if we believe in trans, uh, transition and transformation cost of devolution provinces complain that 7th nfc came before the 18th amendment but sorry this is the half truth council of common interest decided that we will put the bill of higher education and vertical programs of health till the closure of the 7th nfc i can indicate in july because the negotiation for eight nfc have not started yet even provinces only balochistan has nominated its independent member other event so on 1st july your universities will be on road your health vertical program workers and their execution will be problematic unless you extend it we need to handhold and we need to improve intergovernmental communication and cooperation vectors i call it we need to create a federal culture and federal mindset the germany is a classical example and uh, dr vakar sahab will tell me out in berlin every lender has its office in islamabad we have balochistan house sindh house punjab house but there are no more than good guest houses we need to convert them into functional secretariat where every day the provincial government on behalf of provincial government they are negotiating they are bargaining they are pleading their case with the federal government we need to convert them and that means creating nurturing federal culture secondly now we have a tendency to create and establish institutions of federal government where federal government is the my path to dominate everybody we need to create federal institutions where federal government can nominate provincial governments can nominate and then they can sit and decide that should be the idea if we want to achieve uh, next please and these are the scenarios within the constitution extra constitution 
what should pray we are able to avoid. Uh, we are living in a new political culture. First time in the history of Pakistan, every province is controlled by a different political party and a perspective. House of Federation of the Senate is dominated by the opposition. So forget about reversal. You have to negotiate a lot and bring everybody on the board. At least the situation will prevail in the other house in March, but still it will remain opposition dominated. Two-third majority won't be available. And out of the people who are controlling provinces, one chief minister was member of 18th committee, amendment committee, implementation committee. Balochistan. There we should find more vibrant, unfortunately, we don't find that vibrant. Population census is pending. Though there is no, periodicity is not constitutionally or legally defined. It used to be a tradition since 19, uh, 1871. But this tradition has been violated, but it is important because population still enjoys major share, uh, share 82% in distribution of resources. Political wealth is uh, distributed according. Eighth NFC, again, I would say is important for the future of the social sector in Pakistan. Provinces must prepare a convincing case so that they can get more constitutional.